The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Evidence Informing Practice Changing Standards of Care for Use of CDK4 and 6 Inhibitors in the Treatment of Breast Cancer. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash BKK860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, my name is Joyce O'Shaughnessy. I'm the Chair of Breast Cancer Research and the Celebrating Women Chair in Breast Cancer Research at Baylor University Medical Center, Texas Oncology and U.S. Oncology in Dallas, Texas. Welcome to this educational activity on the evolving role and the practical use of CDK4-6 inhibitors in our patients with breast cancer. And joining me in this discussion is Dr. Sarah Tulaney, who is Associate Director of the Susan F. Smith Center for Women's Cancer and Director of Clinical Trials and Breast Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and she's also Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Harvard Medical School. Very happy to have you here with me today, Sarah. Thanks so much, Joyce. I'm glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Well, thank you so much. Well, excellent. Let's go ahead and get started. So in part one, I'm going to discuss CDK4-6 inhibitors just kind of level setting us about data that have already been generated about this important new class of agents as well as talk about some of the new evolving areas of research. So we're gonna talk about the foundational aspects of CDK4-6 inhibitors, including mechanisms of action, the data that led to the current ap approvals and indications of CDK4-6 inhibitors, and some of the similarities and differences among the agents. So first of all, we know that the estrogen receptor leads to the transcription and production of cyclin D1. And cyclin D1 complexes with these proteins, these kinases, CDK4 and 6, and you can see the complex there. And when they, when they join, then CDK4 and 6, they phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein, which then is liberated from E2F and drives that cell cycle. So certainly, in ER-positive breast cancer, cyclin D1 and CDK4-6 are the key nodal points for cell proliferation. Now, as you know, we have three oral inhibitors of these two proteins, CDK4 and 6, so cyclin D1 doesn't have the opportunity to drive this cell cycle. So really, really an excellent way to shut down proliferation in ER-positive breast cancers. So where do these fit now into our armamentarium in terms of what we've had to work with over the last you know, several decades, going back here now, gosh, 40 years to 1980, we had tamoxifen, then we had the aromatase inhibitors, we had fulvestrant at the lower dose in 2002, then we had um, higher dose fulvestrant, which came out later. We finally started getting into the error of doublets with the targeted agent Everolimus against mTOR, then we had the three CDK4-6 inhibitors come out just really starting five years ago. They came out, and then most recently, we had the PI3 kinase inhibitor, alpelosib. So certainly, we're getting more deep and durable control of metastatic ER-positive breast cancers, combining ER inhibition with inhibition of cell proliferation and the PI3 kinase pathway, no, no doubt about it. So let's talk a little bit about these three FDA-approved agents. Well, palbociclib and ribociclib do have some myelosuppression, and they are given, therefore, three weeks on, one week off. They're just once daily orally drugs, 125 milligrams daily for palbociclib, 600 milligrams daily for ribociclib, daily once a day, three weeks on, one week off, not food sensitive. And the uh, palbociclib is approved for the first-line therapy with an aromatase inhibitor, and for patients whose breast cancer has become refractory to AI therapy with fulvestrant and the palbociclib. Ribociclib is also approved for the same indications, first line with an AI, but it's also approved first line with an AI and ovarian suppression for premenopausal women. And then it has another um, approval, not only with fulvestrant in the second line in AI pretreated patients, the ribocyclib, but also first line with fulvestrant and the ribocyclib. Uh, 
Abemacyclib um, is not as myelosuppressive as we'll see as the other two. It's given uh, twice a day, 150 milligrams twice a day in combination with endocrine therapy and is also indicated as a single agent and it's 200 milligrams BID as a single agent without endocrine therapy. As I said, it's given continuously without a break. It also has the indication first line with an AI in women progressing on endocrine therapy, a bemocyclib with fulvestrant, and then lastly as monotherapy after progression on endocrine therapy and chemotherapy, a more heavily pretreated population. So if we look at this slide here and look at the differences among the three CDK4-6 inhibitors, and let's look first at the IC50s. If we look at a bemocyclib and look at the two millimolars of the IC50 for CDK4, we see that that's the lowest IC50 compared to palbocyclib or ribocyclib. And what this means is that a bemocyclib is the most potent of the CDK4-6 inhibitors with regard to inhibition of CDK4. And CDK4 is the main CDK that drives proliferation of breast cancer. The other two are also highly potent, but um, we just see that a bemocyclib is the most potent against CDK4. And furthermore, the CDK6, it's, just a, um, it's, it's also quite potent, but not as potent against CDK6. Uh, That's why it doesn't have as much myelosuppression, because when you inhibit CDK6, you get more in the way of hematologic toxicity. So you get more in the way of GI toxicity if you inhibit CDK4, hence the uh, toxicity profile of abemocyclib. And ribocyclib and uh, palbocyclib are about equipotent and very highly potent against CDK4. And um, the palbocyclib is a little bit more potent against CDK6 than is the ribocyclib, but they're very, very uh, close. So let's look at response rates too as monotherapy in the heavily pretreated population because that also differentiates the agents. And we see for abemocyclib, the response rate was 20% and it was 6% with palbocyclib and 3% with ribocyclib. So um, as we'll talk about here in a moment, the abemocyclib has a broader mechanism of action. Um, it inhibits CDK4-6, but also other uh, CDKs as well. And I think that helps explain its activity, even in the late line setting and heavily pretreated patients. What about CNS penetration? We do know that uh, abemocyclib does penetrate the CNS, as we'll see from Sarah here in a few minutes, and it's possible that palbocyclib and ribocyclib do as well. We just don't have as much information at this time. What about toxicities? There are differential toxicities as well with the palbocyclib and ribocyclib. Having approximately 50% of patients or so who will develop grade 3, 4 neutropenia. Fortunately, the incidence of febrile neutropenia is indeed very low in the 1% range, so that's really fortunate for our patients. Whereas the abemocyclib, the rate of grade 3, 4 neutropenia is only about 27%. So it's less myelosuppressive, as we said, and a little bit more uh, thrombocytopenia with palbocyclib and ribocyclib and less with abemocyclib as well. Now, on the other hand, the abemocyclib does have the toxicity of diarrhea. And we see that in when you give the abemocyclib with endocrine therapy, the grade 3, 4, it's really almost all grade 3 diarrhea is 9.5%. And then when you increase the dose of abemocyclib to 200 milligrams BID as monotherapy, it's 20% grade 3 diarrhea. So that is the distinguishing toxicity of the abemocyclib. And Sarah and I will talk a little bit later about how we manage the diarrhea of abemocyclib and it has less myelosuppression, more myelosuppression with the palbocyclib and the ribocyclib. And then down the bottom, you see that there's a 8% of patients have low grade, grade one, two prolongation of QTC with the ribocyclib. It tends to be something that simply goes away, but we do want to be aware of drug-drug interactions with regard to um, exacerbating QTC prolongation with uh, ribocyclib. I, I did want to say a few words about the difference between chemotherapy-induced neutropenia and palbocyclib or ribocyclib or abemocyclib-induced neutropenia. With chemotherapy-induced neutropenia, the chemotherapy is actually causing DNA damage to the dividing cells, the progenitor cells, granulocyte and macrophage, myoblasts, 
that actually produce our mature neutrophils that the patients need, and you actually get apoptosis of these um, hematopoietic progenitors with chemotherapy. And so it can take the marrow quite a bit of time to recover from that, and there can be actually prolonged, if not permanent, uh, marrow damage from chemotherapy. Totally conversely with the CDK4-6 inhibitors, there is no DNA damage, there's no apoptosis. It's simply cell cycle arrest because CDK6 is important to the proliferation of our progenitor cells as well as our mature neutrophils. So you get cell cycle arrest, but as soon as you stop the agent, you get rapid recovery of the marrow. There's no uh, long-term detrimental effect. There's no real marrow damage whatsoever. So a totally different mechanism of action that we should certainly want to be, be aware of. The other thing I find is really fascinating are recent published data from folks at Harvard that have really looked at the spectrum of activity of abemocyclib versus palbociclib and ribociclib. They all are highly potent in inhibiting cyclin CDK4 and 6. But the abemocyclib also inhibits CDK1 and 2. And that's very important because cyclin E complexes with CDK1 and 2, and it's an alternative way for breast cancer cells, including more aggressive ER positive breast cancers, to drive that cell cycle. So the major uh, potency of abemocyclib is against CDK4 and 6, but also there's activity against. CDK1 and 2. And personally, I think that's why we see later line activity of abemocyclib. Part of it's the potency against CDK4, but also I think it's the broader spectrum of activities. We get more aggressive type of breast cancers, more genomically unstable, multiple subclones of disease. It's helpful to have an agent that has a broader spectrum of activity. So this um, nice paper here really nicely illustrates um, the broader spectrum of activity of the abemocyclib. So with that background on mechanism of action, let's take a look at the clinical evidence that supports our day-to-day -day practice utilizing these agents. So there have been five first-line studies of these three CDK4-6 inhibitors in ER-positive, HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer patients. And the four on the right are phase three trials. And if you look in the red box for the hazard ratio for progression-free survival, you will see absolutely identical results with these three agents. And we also see we're getting beyond two years now in median progression-free survival, more than a 10 to 12 month improvement in median progression-free survival. And Mona Lisa 3, bringing the fulvestrant and the ribocyclib into the first line setting, had a 33 month improve, uh, or 30 month 33-month median progression-free survival. So these are really major step forwards for the first-line treatment of metastatic ear-positive breast cancer. What about in the second-line setting? And this mainly is second-line, or if your patient had recurred on an adjuvant AI, or within a year of finishing her adjuvant AI, and you want to use fulvestrant as your endocrine therapy, these data would speak to that patient, as well as someone who might have had first-line AI therapy, developed progression of disease. Now you want to use fulvestrant. You would utilize these data to inform your practice. And again, with all three of these agents, palbociclib with Paloma 3, abemocyclib Monarch 2, and ribocyclib Mona Lisa 3, we see in the red box again um, identical hazard ratios, the same effectiveness at prolonging progression-free survival. I'll just point out at the bottom that the Paloma 3 population was a more heavily pretreated population. About 34% of patients had had chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. They had had more lines of endocrine therapy. You see the same differential effect um, on progression-free survival, but you'll see the absolute numbers, the absolute uh, magnitude of benefit will be a bit different just because it's simply a more heavily pretreated population. But these three agents all have the same magnitude of effect on progression-free survival in combination with uh, fulvestrin. What about the premenopausal patient? The pivotal trial that led to FDA approval for the premenopausal patient is the Mona Lisa 7 trial, and this is first-line metastatic 
breast cancer, ER positive, HER2 negative, premenopausal women, all of whom received ovarian suppression with gocerolin, and they had the physician's choice of tamoxifen or non-steroidal AI randomized to placebo versus ribocyclid. And if we look at the hazard ratio for progression-free survival here, we see the same exact benefit we saw in the postmenopausal women. The bottom line, in my opinion, with the premenopausal women is they benefit just as much as the postmenopausal women. We just want to go ahead and add an LHRH agonist to their endocrine therapy and their CDK4-6 inhibitor. We can see in the Monarch 2 and Paloma 3 that they also benefit equally well from a full vestrant with a CDK4-6 inhibitor as long as a GnRH analog is added to the, uh, their endocrine therapy. I do want to point out in Mona Lisa 7 that the FDA approved uh, ribocyclib only with a non steroidal AI in the premenopausal women, not with tamoxifen, because who knew, but tamoxifen also has a low-grade incidence of prolonging the QTC a bit. Of course, it's of to totally of no clinical consequence, and so they just thought it was prudent not to combine ribocyclib, which also has this same, you know, very, very low effect. So they just decided we shouldn't combine those two and just approve the non-steroidal uh, AI for the premenopausal women. Now, I guess most importantly, do our women live longer with the use of CDK4-6 inhibitors for their metastatic breast cancer? And thankfully, the answer is yes, they do. If we look here at the Monarch 2 trial as an example, and we'll go through all the data here, we're in the second line setting now, fulvestrant abemacyclib versus fulvestrant and placebo, AI pretreated patients. We saw the strong effect on median progression-free survival. And now we see, very fortunately, just presented uh, last year, late last year, at ESMO and published by George Sledge in JAMA Oncology very recently, we see a survival advantage here with a hazard of 0.75 and about a nine month or so improvement in overall survival and the curves continue to split apart over time. Very, very gratifying, difficult to see, as you know, in the metastatic setting. And we can see the survival curves pulling apart very nicely in the patients with primary resistance. We see the hazard here for survival of 0.68 with the bemocyclib. We also see the curves pulling apart later in those who develop secondary resistance. So they benefit from endocrine therapy and then later on there's an acquired mechanism resistance to endocrine therapy. We do see that the abemocyclib is also helpful for those patients. But note how quickly the curves split apart in those patients who have primary resistance. The abemocyclib takes hold of that cancer very, very quickly, even though the endocrine therapy basically is of no utility to the patient really at that, at that point. What about the Mona Lisa 3 and overall survival? Again, this was a mixed population, first and second line patients. They all received fulvestrant with ribocyclib versus the uh, placebo. And very gratifyingly in this large trial, 726 patients, we see a very nice survival improvement with a hazard of 0.72. And we see um, the survival has not been reached yet with the ribocyclib and fulvestrant. It was 40 months with placebo and fulvestrant. And we see at 42 months, for example, we see an improvement of about 12% um, absolute improvement of patients still alive at the 42 month mark uh, in favor of the ribocyclib and the fulvestrin. Very good to see. And we also see if we break it down into the first and the second line setting, we see these are not statistically significant because they're smaller subpopulations, but we see that the curves look really the same as the overall treated population, strongly suggesting that whether you give the ribocyclib fulvestrin first line or give it second line, that we're going to favorably impact survival, which is very, very exciting. Interestingly, in the Mona Lisa 3, if we look at the primary endocrine therapy resistant versus endocrine therapy sensitive population who then go on to the fulvestrant and ribocyclib, there we see equal activity of the ribocyclib um, in both the primary endocrine therapy resistant and sensitive. So that's good. We can get benefit from the ribocyclib in both of these uh, populations. With regard to Paloma 3, which was, first of all, a smaller trial, 521 patients, and as we mentioned, a more heavily pretreated population, 
in the entire cohort, we do see a seven month absolute improvement in overall survival, utilizing the palbocyclib with fulvestrant in the second line setting in Paloma 3 and the hazard 0.8. It's just a little shy of full statistical significance. Interestingly, if we look at the endocrine therapy sensitive population, we have a 10 month improvement in median survival with a hazard of 0.72. But in the primary endocrine therapy resistant group, we do not see an improvement in overall survival. So this is really very, very interesting, puzzling. It's certainly different than the two studies we just went over. And if we look at this forest plot and just look in the middle here, and we're looking at prior chemotherapy in this population, we see that in the metastatic setting, patients who got metastatic chemotherapy we don't see any benefit from survival with the palbocyclin. Conversely, in patients who had not had chemotherapy in the metastatic setting, who indeed were the same as the patients who got fulvestrant and abemocyclib or fulvestrant and ribocyclib, they didn't get any metastatic chemotherapy. Here we see that the hazard here is 0.68. The confidence intervals cross one. This is a smaller subpopulation but it really raises the question of whether the survival difference seen here in the primary refractory patient population where we did not see a survival advantage may be due to simply patients having had antecedent chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. So I just wanted to stop at this moment because this is an area that comes up quite frequently. I just wanted to get Sarah's input into how she thinks about the survival differences in these trials. And I think it's a really good question. Um, certainly we do see significant survival benefit in Monarch 2, um, for example, but don't see it here in um, Paloma 3 or, and conversely, we did see it in Mona Lisa 3. But I think when putting it into perspective, we can see that all these trials had such different eligibility criteria. So we knew that in Monarch 2, for example, those patients were only really allowed to have had one prior endocrine agent and no prior chemotherapy. And in Mona Lisa 3, some patients were first line and some patients were second line, but again, were not pre heavily pretreated. But as you pointed out, in Paloma 3, these patients could have had as many endocrine lines as you know they wanted um, and could have had, had up to one prior line of chemo. And so it's a very different patient population than Monarch 2 and Mona Lisa 3, um, with them being more heavily pretreated. And I, I think that may be why we're not getting the statistically significant survival benefit. Let me just ask you this, um, Sarah, if you have a patient who you know, has not had chemotherapy in the um, metastatic setting, but she's recurring very rapidly, um, let's say she's got the adjuvant AI and she's recurring at 18 months, let's say, um, would you um, choose a, the abemocyclib or ribocyclib for that patient, you know, strictly on the basis of this subset analysis for survival. I must say I probably would, um, although I, I, take, I take the point that um, in those who did not have chemotherapy here, we do see that point estimate, you know, uh, trending towards improvement, but it's really this primary endocrine therapy uh, resistant population where we don't know for sure that those were all the ones that had chemotherapy. We're just not sure Probably so. If they were primary endocrine therapy refractory, physicians would probably preferentially give those patients the chemotherapy. I just don't know it's the same exact patients, but would you utilize these data then in terms of you know guiding therapeutic recommendations for patients with primary endocrine therapy refractory? Yeah, no, it's a, a good question. Um, you know, I think interestingly, if you look at Monarch 2, um, those patients who were not endocrine sensitive actually seemed to have an even bigger reduction you know, in their hazard um, from adding a bemocyclib than those um, you know, who were more endocrine sensitive. And so it makes me wonder if, which is different than what we're seeing in Paloma 3, right? Um, where we're seeing not seeing benefit in the endocrine refractory population. So it does bring up into question if there are also differences between these CDK4-6 inhibitors in where we're seeing benefit. Obviously these are you know, exploratory analyses um, and it's hard to draw any definitive conclusions. But I do think, you know, 
I certainly would consider trying um, a CDK4-6 inhibitor in that patient and potentially consider a bemocyclib in that particular patient. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah, for the, for the discussion on that. Let's turn to CDK4-6 inhibitor as monotherapy and also in combination with endocrine therapy in later lines of a therapy. And we have the Monarch 1 data that did lead to FDA approval of a bemocyclib at the higher dose of 200 milligrams POBID. The response rate was 19.7% and the clinical benefit rate was 42.4%. And these patients have been pretreated with chemotherapy and endocrine therapy multiple lines. So it's nice to know we do have efficacy of the abemocyclib in late, late line patients. What about combining the CDK4-6 inhibitors with other agents besides AIs and fulvestrant? What about tamoxifen? This next Monarch 1 trial was quite interesting. It was the same patient population as the Monarch 1 patients, again, pretreated with chemotherapy and endocrine therapy, a randomized phase 2 to a bemocyclib 150 BID with tamoxifen versus a bemocyclib 150 BID without tamoxifen. Interesting question. And then also a bemocyclib 200 milligrams BID, the labeled dose with prophylactic uh, loperamide. We see that about a third of the patients and all the arms had already had tamoxifen. And now we're looking at tamoxifen to see if it helps them late line with a bemocyclib. And basically the winner, if you will, of these three arms with, with regard to median progression-free survival was the lower dose of a bemocyclib, 150 milligrams BID with tamoxifen. That was helpful to me. I, it, I think this has told me that, you know, if I'm going to give a CDK4-6 inhibitor, I think I'm going to give it with endocrine therapy. And if I'm going to give a bemocyclib, I will give the 150 BID and I'll give it with uh, endocrine therapy because there is more diarrhea, as I pointed out, with the 200 milligrams BID. So I'm going to go with the 150 and I'm going to give it with endocrine therapy, even in the later line setting. So with that, I'm going to turn us over now to Sarah, who has done some work herself in patients with CNS metastasis, and she'll pick it up from here and tell us about some additional data. Oh, thanks so much, Joyce. Um, so I think we have seen some early data that has emerged looking at CDK4-6 inhibitors for patients who have brain metastases. And so this comes from work that was done looking at a bemocyclib um, in different cohorts of patients. So one cohort was very interesting in that it took patients who had an ER positive brain metastasis, but then were gonna have surgical resection for that brain metastasis. And they gave them a window of exposure of the abemocyclib prior to going to the operating room to have that tumor resected, and then looked at drug levels of the abemocyclib in the tumor, as well as within the CSF and plasma. And what they found was that actually the drug levels were comparable, suggesting that the drug was getting from the bloodstream into the tumor and into the CSF. And in fact, the drug levels in the brain were actually slightly higher than even the plasma, which is very interesting, um, suggesting very good concentration in the tumor. Um, so this is certainly very important because it means that the agent can get into the brain um, and get into the tumor. But then I think what was particularly important was also that it can have activity in someone who has CNS metastasis. So in a cohort of patients who had ER positive HER2 negative brain metastases, when treated with a bemocyclib, this was at the 200 BID dose, the response rate at time of the final analysis for this was actually 5%. So, you know, overall the response rate was on the lower side, but as you can see, there are multiple patients who have reduction in their um, tumor size and many patients who are deriving clinical benefit from treatment. Um, and so I think this was really a proof of principle that a bemocyclib can have activity for patients with ER positive brain metastases. And I think very interestingly, there can also be some activity for patients who have leptomeningeal disease. So there is a separate cohort for patients who had ER positive, HER2 negative leptomeningeal involvement. And there was one patient who actually did achieve a complete response in their parenchymal lesion um, in this cohort of patients. And I think importantly, survival for this cohort was a little over eight months. 
And we know that unfortunately survival in patients who have leptomeningeal disease is usually just a few months. Um, and so, you know, compared to historical data, this does seem longer than we typically would see. Um, and so I think it, there is some suggestion that abemaciclib can have activity for patients with both parenchymal and leptomeningeal disease. Joyce, how have you interpreted these data? Do you think that these data influence you in any way when selecting particular CDK4-6 inhibitors um, for a patient, for example, that may have brain metastasis? Yeah, very, very definitely. Um, and you know, the, the data you showed here and were involved with, Sarah, the response rate you know, ended up being quite low, you know, just around 5% in the entire cohort in terms of an objective response. So these were heavily pretreated patients, whole brain radiation, multiple rounds of SRS. You know, getting objective responses is difficult, but I'm intrigued as well by the clinical benefit rate. There were more patients who had prolonged stable disease, lack of progression. And honestly, that's how I tend to use things. Sarah, if we have brain metastasis, we'll do SRS. And then we're looking for an agent that will prevent the um, recurrence of brain metastasis. That's where I really turn to the abemaciclib. I remember a, a case, a very gratifying case of a patient with a very aggressive luminal B, uh, invasive pleomorphic lobular cancer, preoperative chemotherapy, still a lot of disease at mastectomy, six positive nodes. And about 18 months later on her letrozole, she developed too numerous to count brain metastasis. One had to be resected in the cerebellum. It was too big. She got whole brain radiation. There was no way to do SRS. And she went on a clinical trial at that time of abemaciclib. She kept on her um, letrozole because she didn't have any systemic recurrence. And in her uh, metastasis from her cerebellum, we found a 20-fold amplicon of cyclin D1, which drives that CDK4-6. Do you know she had three years of progression-free survival. So, uh, say no more, it became my drug, you know, for these patients. Again, I think it's important, we gotta get control of disease first with radiotherapy, but then I think it's really gratifying to see that these patients can then go a great great period of time without, well, without progression in some situations. So uh, yeah, that's my choice for sure, Sarah. Yeah, no, that, that's really nice to hear. Um, so I think you know another question that comes up is we now have three different CDK4-6 inhibitors that are available to us. Um, are there patients that are gonna benefit more than another patient um, from a CDK4-6 inhibitor? Or are there patients who we should just know up front wouldn't be able to benefit? Are there sort of molecular or clinical predictors that are gonna help us differentiate that? And I think one thing that's been challenging to us is when we look across subgroup analyses from the large trials that have been done with CDK4-6 inhibitors, in fact, we can't tease out who is likely to benefit. It seems that everyone benefits. So um, again, if you look across all the subgroups, you see that everyone is deriving additional benefit from the um, CDK4-6 inhibitor and that there really isn't a subgroup where there's lack of benefit really suggesting that ER positivity itself is really the predictor for who's going to, to benefit. There have been lots of attempts to try and tease out different clinical parameters to see if we may be able to find patients who derive more or less benefit. And one very interesting analysis was a pooled analysis that was done combining patients from both Monarch 2 and Monarch 3. And they looked at various clinical parameters and then looked at how those were associated with outcome. So when we looked at this subgroup analysis from uh, Monarch 2 and Monarch 3, what we saw was that those patients who had a short treatment-free interval, so those patients who relapsed soon after their adjuvant therapy, seemed to derive an even greater benefit from the addition of abemaciclib relative to those patients who actually had a delayed um, recurrence. So those patients who had a prolonged treatment-free interval where we're seeing less benefit from abemaciclib. And this similar trend was also seen in patients who had visceral involvement. So if we looked at those patients who had liver metastases, we can see even greater benefit compared to those patients without liver metastases. 
And we see the converse with bone metastases. So patients who had bone metastases did not seem to derive as great of a benefit from the addition of abemocyclib compared to patients with the liver metastases. So I think putting all of that together, it really suggests that patients who have what we would consider more higher risk features or concerning clinical characteristics, so patients with you know, early relapse, patients with visceral involvement, patients with higher grade tumors, those are patients who seem to drive even greater benefit from abemocyclib. Um, this is a little different than what we see with some of the other CDK4-6 inhibitors. If specifically you look at data from ribocyclib, we can see that while certainly all subgroup of, of patients benefit, and whether they have liver mets or bone metastases, everybody is deriving benefit from the addition of ribocyclib. We can see even greater benefit though in those patients with bone only disease, um, which is again, sort of different than what we saw with the abemocyclib, where we saw greater benefit in the patients with visceral involvement rather than with bone only. So um, again, I think suggesting some small subtle differences um, in some of the subgroup benefits um, that we're seeing. Data that will, at ASCO, that will be looking at also this correlation of um, whether or not someone has endocrine refractory disease or visceral involvement and correlating it with both progression-free and overall survival from Monarch 2, really suggesting that, again, all patients derive benefit, including those patients with these concerning clinical characteristics, such as having endocrine refractory disease or having uh, visceral involvement. So while we can't really tease out a patient by clinical characteristics to say who's going to benefit and who's not going to benefit from a CDK4-6 inhibitor since everyone seems to derive benefit who has ER positive disease. Another thought was could we look at genomic um, or molecular predictors of benefit from CDK4-6 inhibition? And there have been multiple attempts at trying to find a biomarker predictor across the phase three pivotal trials. And unfortunately, we have not yet been able to find such a biomarker predictor. And looking at, you know, cyclin D, RB, PIK3CA, ESR1, um, we see that all patients seem to derive benefit within all these subgroups. So uh, again, using simple genomic predictors was not able to tease out who's going to uh, benefit most. There are some clues, though, for patients who may not benefit as much. And so we do see some data looking at those patients who have FGFR1 amplification, for example, that did seem to have early progression on ribocyclib in the Mona Lisa 2 study. And from Paloma 3, we also saw that those patients who had um, higher levels of cyclin E uh, expression seem to um, have worse outcomes on the study, whereas compared to those patients who had low levels of cyclin E, they seem to derive greater benefit from palbocyclib, suggesting that potentially FGFR amplification and cyclin E um, expression may correlate with less benefit. But I think, again, these are hypotheses generating and will need to be prospectively validated um, with further studies. So I think putting this all together, um, you know, we can see that CDK4-6 inhibitors seem to benefit all patients with ER positive disease, that we do not yet have a molecular biomarker predictor for benefit. Um, but I think that leaves us with the question of really um, who needs to get a CDK4-6 inhibitor up front? Is it everyone with ER positive disease? Are there some patients who may not need it? Well, you know, as time goes on now, we've had these agents a few years. I'm at the point where I only would recommend chemotherapy for first-line metastatic patients if the end organ function was dysfunctional enough because of the burden of cancer in the organ that I would really only have one chance to get control of the disease. And if it didn't work, then the patients wouldn't be well enough to get a second line. And that's a very small percentage of patients in my practice, probably 10% or less, when now I'm super, super comfortable for the simple reason that the median PFS first line with CDK4-6 inhibitors is well over two years. And even with combination chemotherapy, median PFS is in the you know eight to nine month range. So it's three times as long with the CDK4-6 inhibitor. So 
Um, I am, I've really totally gone over to the CDK 4-6 inhibitors and use much, much less chemotherapy first line uh, as, I, as I used to. So I certainly would agree and, and practice similarly. You know, I think some data that we can pull from to help inform us um, whether or not it makes sense to choose CDK4-6 inhibitors with endocrine therapy over chemotherapy have really come out from both the young PEARL and the PEARL trials. You know, we had seen the young PEARL trial, which had looked at patients who were premenopausal and had received prior tamoxifen and could have received up to one prior line of chemotherapy for their metastatic disease, and then randomized them to receive ovarian suppression with an AI and palbociclib, and then compared this to capecitabine. And what we found was that there did seem to be a trend towards benefit of the endocrine therapy with CDK4-6 inhibition over the capecitabine uh, with a median PFS of around 20 months with the CDK4-6 combination compared to around 14 months with capecitabine. And I think importantly, you know, there are differences in toxicities between these approaches where we saw with certainly with palbociclib based therapy there's more neutropenia um, but with capecitabine we deal with more diarrhea and hand foot syndrome and this was similar study that was done in women who were ai refractory so they had to have recurred within 12 months of their AI or progressed um, within a month of um, completing their AI in the metastatic setting. And they were randomized to receive endocrine therapy with palbociclib or capecitabine. And really what we saw was that there wasn't a difference um, between the two arms, suggesting that endocrine therapy with CDK4-6 inhibitors performed similarly to capecitabine. So, you know, certainly the trial was designed to, to see superiority and it did not meet that. Um, but really the progression-free survivals are fairly similar between the two arms. Um, and we did again see less toxicity with the CDK4-6 arm um, with fewer discontinuations and fewer SAEs in that arm. And so I think given these data, it certainly made me feel more comfortable with the choice to think about using CDK4-6 inhibitors and endocrine therapy upfront for the vast majority of my patients. So while I think we sometimes struggle with this decision of you know endocrine therapy, CDK4-6 versus chemo, I think another question we sometimes think about, well, if we're gonna give the patient CDK4-6 inhibition with endocrine therapy, does it matter if we give the, the CDK4-6 inhibitor to them first line, or would it matter if we gave it to them second line? Um, would it change their outcomes? You know, we certainly know that there's survival benefit from giving CDK4-6 inhibition, but would that survival be different if they had received, you know, an AI followed by a fulvestrant CDK versus starting out with the AI CDK and moving on to fulvestrant? Would we see a difference in their survival outcomes? And so one trial that is actually trying to address this question is the SONIA study, um, where patients are actually randomized to do just that in a sequential fashion. So either get, you know, an AI with or without CDK4-6 and then um, if move on to fulvestrant second line, and if you didn't get the CDK4-6 first line, you would get it um, second line. So it'll be interesting to see um, how those data pan out and see if um, it affects long-term outcomes depending on which order you gave the CDK4-6 inhibitor in. So there is a lot of exciting data at ASCO, data from the Parsifal trial. This really addresses the question of, does it matter what endocrine therapy you use when you give a CDK4-6 inhibitor? For example, does it matter if you give upfront AI with the CDK4-6? Um, would it be better to use fulvestrant with a CDK4-6 inhibitor? You know, we have data from Falcon that had initially suggested that fulvestrant may be superior to an AI, particularly in that population, which was more of a de novo population. Um, and so we've all wondered, you know, sh should we be selecting our endocrine backbone um, differently and would it matter once you put the CDK4-6 on board? Um, and so the Parsifal trial really suggested that there wasn't a significant difference between AI CDK and fulvestrant CDK. Um, you know, it was a randomized phase two trial, um, so not a definitive study, um, but I think, you know, suggests that maybe when you give a CDK4-6 inhibitor, choice of endocrine backbone may not matter. I like to actually um, utilize the fulvestrant in a later line of 
therapy. For example, if a patient's pic 3 ca mutant, I like to come in with alpelacib and fulvestrant after progression on a CDK4-6. So I tend to still use the AIs um, up front, unless a person has a history of real intolerance to AIs, then of course, fulvestrant's a great choice. Oh. I think it, it like leaves our options a little bit more flexible um, with those fulvestrant combinations, particularly now with alpalisib approval uh, in the second line setting. Um, and without a, a significant um, difference seen in Parsifal, it's hard to drive us to, to use fulvestrant up front. So I think most of us are utilizing CDK4-6 inhibitors pretty uniformly in patients in the first line setting. We're now getting faced with the question is, what do we do after someone progresses on their first line endocrine therapy with CDK4-6 inhibition therapy? One question that comes up is, well, would there be a role for continuing the CDK4-6 inhibitor beyond progression? So for example, if I gave a patient uh, an AI with CDK4-6 inhibitor and then I was gonna move them on to fulvestrant therapy, would it make sense to continue that CDK4-6 inhibitor um, with the fulvestrant? And so there are a couple of trials that are trying to address that question. Uh, both the MAINTAIN trial and the PACE trial are addressing this, and those studies are still ongoing, so we don't have data from those trials yet. Um, so certainly outside um, of a clinical trial, we don't know that there's benefit. Um, there are also studies that are looking at different add-on strategies um, to continuing CDK4-6 inhibition. So we have seen data from the Trinity trial, which looked at the combination of exemestane with everolimus and um, ribocyclob in patients who had already progressed on an upfront CDK4-6 inhibitor. I think the challenge with this trial is that it was not a randomized study, um, so it wasn't compared to exemestane and everolimus alone. Um, and the PFS that we're, we were seeing in that study wasn't that different from what we've previously seen with um, exemestane and everolimus, at least in some retrospective series of patients post-CDK4-6. So I think we just don't know really if, if this strategy would um, provide additional benefit. I think another thing that we think about when trying to approach a patient after CDK4-6 inhibition is, well, what are the resistance pathways that are emerging um, after CDK4-6? Could this help guide us in terms of trying to figure out treatment approaches for that patient? And I think we've learned a lot over the last few years in terms of some resistance mechanisms, but I think what we've learned is that it isn't one mutation um, that's driving everyone to become resistant to CDK4-6. In fact, some patients are developing endocrine resistance as their mechanism of resistance, whereas other patients have a multitude of different reasons they could be resistant to their CDK4-6 inhibitor. Is it because they um, developed an or a kinase amplification, because they lost RB, because they developed a HER2 mutation? Um, you know, I think there's just so many different pathways that we're seeing can be altered and that it isn't a one-size-fits-all type of uh, approach to these patients. And so there are lots of trials that are ongoing um, trying to address that. I think one practical question that comes up is, what if we switched the CDK4-6 inhibitor? Um, would that actually derive benefit? There's some preclinical data to suggest that abemocyclib can have activity in a palbocyclob or ribocyclob resistant model, whereas we didn't see that um, with using palbocyclob, for example, post abemocyclib, uh, again, in these preclinical models. And so there have been some series that have been put together of patients who in clinical practice had gone on to get abemocyclib post, um, for example, palbocyclib. And there does seem to be some suggestion that some patients do derive clinical benefit. Again, these are not randomized trials. These are retrospective series, so it's hard to draw conclusive um, evidence. But again, um, you know, it is definitely um, hypothesis generating. Um, there is actually a trial that was recently closed, but had, I think, I think is more of a proof of principle, but taken patients who got upfront endocrine therapy with um, a CDK4-6 inhibitor that was not a bemocyclob, so it could be palbocyclob or ribocyclob, but then continued that same endocrine backbone and just switched them to a bemocyclob, because I think that would really be a proof of principle is can you then 
reverse that endocrine resistance and allow now a new CDK4-6 inhibitor to work. And so we don't have data from that trial uh, at this point in time, uh, but I think, uh, again, will be um, educational for us to see if that, that actually pans out. So while I think there's definite benefit for these agents in the metastatic setting, many of us are eagerly awaiting data to see if these agents will have a role in the early disease setting. We have both the PALACE and Monarch E trial have completed accrual and are, we're awaiting data from these studies. Uh, PALACE had looked at two years of adjuvant palbociclib in combination with endocrine therapy for adjuvant treatment. And this trial did allow patients with stage 2A through stage 3 disease. Whereas the Monarch E trial was a little different in that it picked um, higher risk patients. So generally speaking, patients who had four or more uh, positive lymph nodes or had to have a large tumor size and high grade tumors or have high KI-67 um, and gave those patients two years of abemocyclob. It was recently announced that following a pre-planned efficacy and futility analysis, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee of Palace determined that the trial is unlikely to show a statistically significant improvement in the primary endpoint of invasive disease-free survival. Long-term follow-up of all patients will proceed as planned. In contrast, it was also recently reported that the Monarch E trial has yielded positive results. Abemaciclib, in combination with standard adjuvant endocrine therapy, has met the primary endpoint of invasive disease-free survival significantly decreasing the risk of breast cancer recurrence or death compared with standard adjuvant endocrine therapy alone. The results are from a pre-planned interim analysis and make abemaciclib the only CDK4 and 6 inhibitor to demonstrate a statistically significant reduction in the risk of cancer recurrence for people with high-risk hormone receptor-positive HER2-negative early breast cancer. Detailed results will be presented at a medical meeting later in 2020. Um, there is data from Penelope B that is also pending looking at one year of adjuvant palbociclib in patients who had residual disease after preoperative therapy. And there is one trial that is still enrolling, which um, is a Natalie study, which is looking at three years of ribociclib and in fact is using a slightly lower dose, so using the 400 milligram dose on the three weeks on, one week off schedule, but again using a three year duration, so longer than, than the other studies have looked at. So, you know, while again, we've shown that there's activity of combining endocrine therapy with CDK4-6, I think there's lots of interest in seeing if we, if we used an add-on strategy to add an additional targeted therapy, could we make um, the activity even better? And so there is some preclinical work suggesting that um, PI3 kinase mutations may decrease sensitivity um, to CDK4-6 inhibition that could potentially be reversed by adding on a, a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Um, and so there are trials um, that have been conducted trying to add on uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors to CDK4-6 with endocrine therapy. And there's also some preclinical data suggesting that CDK4-6 inhibitors can augment the immune response. So they do seem to increase antigen expression, increase interferon signatures, uh, and increase uh, T cell um, infiltration. So, you know, while it's clear that CDK4-6 inhibitors have a role in ER positive disease, um, what I think many of us wonder is, will it have a role in other subtypes of breast cancer? So there was um, a trial that was conducted, the Monarch HER trial, that really looked to see if CDK4-6 inhibitors could work in patients with metastatic HER2-positive disease. This trial took patients who had progressed on two lines of HER2-directed therapy for their metastatic disease and randomized them to either receive fulvestrant with abemaciclib and trastuzumab or to receive abemaciclib, trastuzumab, or to receive chemotherapy, trastuzumab. And what the trial demonstrated was that the three drug combination, the fulvestrin to bemocyclib trastuzumab arm, performed better than the chemotherapy trastuzumab arm with about a two and a half month difference in progression free survival and also doubled the response rate compared to chemotherapy and trastuzumab. And, you know, I think it's really exciting to think that we could eventually have an endocrine therapy CDK4-6 um, inhibitor anti HER2 therapy for these patients as a chemotherapy sparing uh, treatment option for patients in a later HER2 um, setting.
And so there are further studies being done to explore um, CDK4-6 inhibitors in the HER2 positive space, uh, including the PATINA trial, looking at using CDK4-6 inhibitors more as a maintenance strategy um, in patients who come off their first line chemo um, trastuzumab, pertuzumab combination and go on to that HP maintenance with endocrine therapy and then adding on um, the CDK4-6 inhibitor to that maintenance. And there's also the Patricia trial, uh, which is comparing palbocycle and um, endocrine therapy with anti-HER2 therapy to uh, chemo of physician's choice, including TDM1. So I think there will be more to come for CDK4-6 inhibitors in the HER2 positive space. Sarah, thank you for that amazing discussion. You covered a lot of data, very helpful for our practice, but all the new things coming as well. That was really outstanding. Um, so I thought it'd be useful if we turn to some cases because we do want to talk about, you know, again, selection of patients for CDK4-6 inhibitors versus other avenues of therapy, which CDK4-6 inhibitor that we um, use, um, and do we ever sequence them in our own practice, uh, as well as what do we do after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, as well as maybe some pointers, some hints about managing of toxicity. So I'm going to start and talk about the use of CDK4-6 inhibitors in patients with virulent disease. You know, we've kind of alluded to this um, already. And I had mentioned that I really uh, just restrict first-line chemotherapy use to patients who are really truly in visceral crisis, whereas it's the only time I've got to basically salvage them and they wouldn't be able to live long enough to get second-line therapy if I don't get control of the disease. That's where I use the chemotherapy. But with regard to what choice of the CDK4-6 inhibitor, I'd like to illustrate a patient who I took care of some years back that really um, opened my eyes to the non-cross resistance of abemocyclib, even very late line. We've seen these data in the Monarch 1 in a heavily pretreated population, 20% response rate, 42% clinical benefit rate. And I had a patient who was an um, African-American veterinarian who presented around age 40, early 40s, with a multiply node positive, ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, and got standard chemotherapy, had a BSO, went on to letrozole, and had about a three-year uh, disease-free interval, and then recurred initially bone only, and she was still ER positive, HER2 negative, and she had a series of endocrine uh, therapies, um, including everolimus. We didn't have CDK4-6 inhibitors at that time, and then she went on, as per standard of care, to a number of sequential chemotherapies, and she indeed went through all of our um, chemotherapies. And along the way, when she was transitioning from, chemo, from endocrine therapy to chemotherapy, she developed liver metastases, and she, those grew over time as this typical progression of our luminal B breast cancers. And unfortunately, it came towards the, uh, getting towards the end of her life where she had um, basically emerging liver failure. She had ha hyperaminemia. She did require some lactulose to keep her uh, ammonia down. Then she developed brain metastases. She required whole brain radiation. And I saw her after the brain radiation. She came back. She was in a wheelchair. Her performance status was very close to four. She still was requiring the um, lactulose because uh, she was a little hyperbilirubinemic, et cetera. Very, very poor performance status. And I realized she had never had a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Had been a long time since she had endocrine therapy. So I gave her fulvestrant and abemocyclib at a careful dose. I think I started with 100 BID. And do you know, she went back to work as a veterinarian. She had a true Lazarus effect, 18 months. 18 months disease control. Bilirubin came down to normal. LFTs came down close to normal, off the lactulose, uh, et cetera. Most amazing case I had seen in a really long time. So I realized the non-cross resistance. She had multiple subclones. Luminal Bs are already genomically unstable. You're going to have a lot of subclones. You need broader spectrum agents. And um, so that really made me a fan of abemocyclib in the patient who 
who I thought would be least likely to benefit from endocrine therapy is the way I put it. That's where, but I want to use a CDK inhibitor, but I'm going to choose a bemocyclic for that particular uh, patient. So how about you, Sarah? How do you um, choose now, of course, if somebody comes in with, you know, liver metastasis, short disease-free interval, really manifesting endocrine therapy resistance, I will go use that same, you know, knowledge of the biology of disease and a bemocyclic utility in the first line setting, basically extrapolating. But how about you, Sarah? How do you tend to choose between CDK4-6 inhibitors in the, in the first line setting? I think very similar to you. I think taking um, into consideration those clinically concerning characteristics. Um, so the patients with you know visceral involvement or short disease free interval, maybe patients I may choose for a bemocyclib, certainly anyone with um, a history of brain metastases, although that certainly is rare in an early stage um, ER positive, um, you know, early line metastatic ER positive patient. Um, then I would think about a bemocyclib as well. Outside of that, you know, I think there are rare things that sometimes will push me one way or the other. You know, if someone has irritable bowel syndrome, I'm not going to want to give them a bemocyclib. If someone has um, sort of baseline chronic neutropenia or has such marrow involvement that their counts are so low, then I probably choose a bemocyclib over ribocyclib or palbocyclib because they're not going to be able to tolerate that level of neutropenia. So, you know, I think it's more of an individualized decision based on their comorbidities, you know, blood counts, and then again, if they have any clinically concerning characteristics. Yeah, very, very similar um, as, as well. So I wanted to bring up another um, scenario of patients with more indolent disease, where I feel more comfortable, you know, um, dealer's choice, you know, with regard to um, CDK4-6 inhibitor, perhaps choosing based on um, toxicity profiles, as you mentioned. But I'll, I'll mention um, this patient. One is a um, Mm, early 40s year old um, woman, a physician in our center, uh, who unfortunately she has a check two mutation, germline mutation, and you know unfortunately recurred even after optimal adjuvant chemotherapy, um, LHRH agonist, optimal endocrine therapy. She recurred about four years down the road, plural based only disease, and it um, came time to, you know, consider what therapy to give her. Of course, biopsy proven, ER positive, HER2 negative, but just plural-based disease. That tends to be a very endocrine therapy sensitive site of metastasis. So I recommended um, fulvestrant uh, to her, and I recommended um, palbocyclib uh, to her, uh, mainly because of the lesser toxicity profile, the lack of GI toxicity that we see with a bemocyclib. And so she started in, she was tolerating it beautifully, and her, she has a tumor, an informative tumor marker, and it leveled off. Her, her tumor marker leveled off. It had been climbing, and it leveled off, um, but only leveled off for like three, four months, and then it started kind of slowly creeping, totally asymptomatic. So we ended up getting re-imaging studies, and she indeed had some modest progression of her disease, totally asymptomatic. I was very disappointed. I really wanted her to get the standard, you know, two years plus out of CDK4-6 inhibitor. So we talked about it and we did switch her to the abemocyclib and she's uh, remains on the fulvestrant. And, you know, she has had um, better control of the disease. She didn't have a, you know, complete plummeting of the tumor marker nor, in, you know, complete response on imaging, but she has had improvement and she's been able to be maintained now well over a year and counting on on the abemocyclib. So it's just quite, quite quite a bit interesting. Yeah, and I have um, had a patient similarly, but for a different reason, switch over um, from um, endocrine therapy with palbocyclib to endocrine therapy with abemocyclib. In this particular case, she was a 50 three-year-old woman who had metastatic ear positive disease and presented with bone and lymph node involvement. And we had started her on um, letrozole with palbocyclib and she had a really nice response. She was doing well, um, but 
we couldn't get her to be on the CDK4-6 inhibitor very much. She was always on her letrozole, but every time she'd come in, she was neutropenic. Um, and so I went from 125 of palvo to 100 of palvo to 75 of palvo, and she just couldn't tolerate it. Her counts, you know, were, she was always neutropenic, even at 75. Um, so we discontinued the palbociclib, and I kept the letrozole on board, but then switched her to a bemocyclib. And she was actually able to tolerate the abemocyclib fine. Um, she did have some you know, intermittent diarrhea, but her counts were um, fine um, at the 150 BID of abema dose. Um, and she was able to remain on it for probably an additional eight to 10 months with disease control. Um, she actually just recently progressed. Um, and interestingly enough, did have an ESR1 mutation on progression by ctDNA. And so she actually just went on to a trial with an oral CERD. Um, so that'll be interesting to, to see how she does. Um, but, you know, I think sort of to your point about individualizing treatments also based on toxicity in this particular case, you know, it's nice that we have some choices um, and so that we could switch over um, to bemocyclib in her particular case to, to allow her to continue. I have, I, I have a couple of ex examples just like that um, as well. And you know, I must say, I, I tend to tolerate grade three neutropenia. Grade four, I get, I get more concerned about. But you know, some of our patients, you do reduce the dose of palbocyclib or ribocyclib, but you don't see a big difference you know, in terms of the hematologic uh, toxicity. But patients do, do so well. So I'm always a little reluctant to change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I'm always a little reluctant to change. Although I have had patients, I've had no choice. You know, they really get so low on their counts, you know, that I have no choice. And I have changed to bemocyclib and it's been, it's been quite, quite successful in that regard. So what about um, GI toxicity with the bemocyclib? Uh, Sarah, how do you approach this, you know, when you're just starting somebody on a bemocyclib? How do you tell them what to expect and what do you kind of advise them? Yeah, uh, no, it's a good question. Um, so we do know that most of the diarrhea that occurs will happen usually with a median to five to seven days with a bemocyclib. And so my approach generally is to make sure that they have loperamide at home um, and for some of my women, tell them to put it in their purse uh, to make sure that they always have it on them. Um, and that if they do have onset of loose stool, that they should take two lopiramide at onset and then certainly repeat lopiramide use um, with one tablet if it recurs. Um, I do tell them to call me though. So, you know, I do like to check in with everyone um, if they are having diarrhea because there are some patients who, you know, may have more than just a loose stool here or there, but are having a lot of diarrhea, in which case I actually do tell them to hold um, the abemocyclib, wait till it improves. And then, you know, depending on the duration of the diarrhea, I will sometimes dose reduce them if it lasted a few days, and then I'll go down to 100. And it is really usually very dose responsive. So coming down from that 150 to 100 usually makes a world of difference for patients. I do not give them prophylactic um, low pyramide, for example. You know, there has been a study that was done, um, a couple studies now with one in Neomonarch, they had looked at low pyramide prophylaxis and actually found high rates of constipation. Um, and I, so that probably wasn't ideal. In Next Monarch, as you presented, um, there was the arm that used lopiramide as well as prophylaxis, but that was in the arm that had the 200 BID dose as monotherapy and, and did show that in that case that the lopiramide prophylaxis did bring down rates of grade three, four diarrhea to be similar to the 150 BID dosing. Um, but since most of the time I am using a bemocyclib with endocrine therapy, I'm using the 150 dose um, twice daily, and so I'm not giving prophylactic um, you know, anti-diarrheal therapy, but usually just telling them to use it as needed, which does seem to work, and then using dose reduction um, as needed as well. Yeah, and I do it very, very similar. I have to tell them to keep it with them at all times, the loperamide, and to keep a diary. To keep a diary when it starts, you know, how many they're having. Well, I have found the women figured this out. I didn't know what to tell them initially, but they now I tell them that women seem to very quickly change their diets. I find, I will say that this is the first four to six weeks. After that, the diarrhea, it almost tachyphylaxes down to where chronically they'll get like one or two loose stools a week. And they can go out because they, if they you know, want to take us on the safe side, you can just take a low paramide that day, but they don't even really have to. They just have it with them. It's not going to be something that's going to be significant. You know, they can once or twice a week, but in the beginning, in the first four to six weeks, I find that women are eating 
um, blander, not heavy, you know, fatty or spicy meals all at once, just eating grazing, a little bit more grazing and a little bit more blander eating. And they find that it really does help and they can kind of predict if they eat certain things, you know, that they like a heavy fatty meal, for example, they'll have more diarrhea. So it seems to be quite diet dependent in most women and they really can quickly get on top of it. I will say, I would say that about five, maybe 8% of my patients, I would say have had very significant diarrhea, you know, really at the grade three level where they really have had to hold the, um, the abemacyclib. And, um, you know, <clears throat> one patient was quite severe. I had to, I actually went down to 50 milligrams twice a day. She was able to tolerate it though after that. And she really benefited from it. So we just, we just left her there, but I do agree it is dose, dose uh, responsive, but there is a small percentage of patients who will get very, very substantial diarrhea. So I think they, they have to know that if they start getting more than four loose, five loose stools a day, they should stop it and give us, give us a phone call. So um, it does tend to uh, get much, much better over, over time. Sarah, I want to ask you um, whether you or the folks at the Dana-Farber have thought about anything we should do to alter our practice with regard to our breast cancer patients and management of the breast cancer in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. I know Boston has unfortunately seen quite a few cases, a lot of ill patients, and I read some guidelines or some consensus statements from the Dana-Farber that I found were very helpful, some real food for thought about how we might approach patients in general and also around the CDK4-6 inhibitors, of course, where we do see some myelosuppression in some patients. So what have you guys been doing in this regard? Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's been a challenging time, I think, for everyone um, and has made us really rethink a lot about how we're approaching patients uh, during this time. You know, I think in general, our oncology patients are at more risk because we do immunosuppress them with a lot of our therapies um, and makes us concerned if they were to develop a COVID infection, how they would be able to tolerate it. Um, and so we have, you know, tried to be thoughtful about this. Um, one thing that we certainly have thought about with regards to CDK4-6 inhibitors is, as you mentioned, you know, they are marrow suppressive, they can cause neutropenia. Um, you know, while they do that, they haven't caused high rates of febrile neutropenia, so infectious complications do seem to be rare. Um, and, you know, I think in general, most of the marrow suppression does seem to come early on, meaning usually within the first one to two months when you're starting someone on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, you know, you may need to adjust doses, for example, um, to get them at, you know, a good level of their neutrophil counts. But then once you do that, usually they're fine. And, you know, then we're really only checking counts every couple months and they're doing great. Um, and so one of the things that we discussed when thinking about the guidelines is, would it make sense potentially to delay that starting a CDK4-6 inhibitor, for example, in a patient that you otherwise would initiate treatment on um, if rates of COVID are particularly high and delay that until rates of COVID go down. Whereas for someone who's already on a CDK4-6 inhibitor that you already know is tolerating treatment well, that we're not holding therapy in those patients because we know their counts generally are okay. And I think in, the other point is really that we have tried to, you know, minimize risk for the patients as much as we can by trying to allow them to be at home as much as they can and not coming into the clinic environments if not needed. Um, so, you know, a lot of our patients who, again, are on stable CDK4-6 inhibitor doses aren't getting their labs checked quite as often anymore, usually every couple months. And then they can even do telehealth visits now to um, assess toxicity. And some of my patients who may come from a far distance, um, you know, we've allowed them to get local labs and just send those to me and then do a telehealth visit. So again, trying to minimize um, exposures as much as we can for our patients. How have you guys uh, adjusted things uh, on your end? Similarly, I would uh, say more in the way of telehealth, um, trying to, you know, if you have a choice between an AI or full vestrant, use an AI to minimize the amount of time they're, um, they're visiting we haven't had as much a COVID in the Dallas um, area. So I haven't, um, you know, changed the practice patterns that, that much, you know what I mean? I, we haven't, you know, for example, postponed the start of the, um, of the CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor. But certainly if we, if we did start it and somebody had, you know, had one of those unusual, really myelosuppressive 
um, you know, consequences, then I think, you know, holding it would certainly make a lot of sense or potentially using abemacyclib, you know, as an alternative if they really had enough disease to warrant it. Certainly in someone, as you said, you know, has more indolent disease, bone only, you know, for example, really ER driven sites of disease, certainly going with endocrine therapy alone would certainly be reasonable. I'm thinking about a patient of mine who um, is on one of our adjuvant trials and she is getting the um, the abemacyclib in the Monarch E trial and she was very concerned. Patients are concerned. They're they're worried about you know the myelosuppression and whether they may, may be more at risk for, for COVID. Fortunately, her counts have been been great and um, you know I was able to reassure her that um, she's really not at, not at risk for, for myelosuppression because she as you said she's quite a ways out here now. She hasn't had any problems so things are not going to change but there really is a lot of concern. So I think individualizing it for patients that we could put a hold on the CDK4-6, hold off on starting it, you know, for a few months. Um, and hopefully we'll see, you know, diminution in cases here. But um, fortunately, not a whole lot of changes overall to our, to our overall practice management. Yeah. I mean, it has also been nice to see the changes that are occurring in the clinic as well. You know, I think, um, you know, everyone now, the physicians, the patients, everyone's wearing a mask. We're minimizing the number of patients who are coming into the clinic. The chairs in the waiting room are now, you know, really far apart. Um, and I, I think, honestly, my patients who come in are very comforted um, to feel like, you know, the risk from being in clinic is pretty minimal um, because of all the um, safety and precautions that have been put in place, which is, I, I think, really nice to see. Yeah, means a lot to means a lot to them, you know, really safeguarding their health. Yeah, so I want to thank you so much. It's been so enjoyable talking to you. You've done a fabulous job with the um, summarizing all these data for us. And so this has just been a great discussion overall. And I want to thank you very much for your participation today. We've really focused on when and how to use the CDK four six inhibitors in metastatic breast cancer patients, as well as really foreshadowed the data to come because we'll be using these agents in a lot more settings across the natural history of breast cancer and various breast cancer subtypes. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. I hope all of you listening have found this discussion to be informative and very useful for your practice. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash BKK860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly. For further information concerning Lilly Grant funding, visit www.lillygrantoffice.com. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.